to fellowship with us tonight. And we pray, dear Father, that you will come now and magnify yourself before us, that we would be lost in wonder, love, and praise. Hear our cry, for we ask in the Saviour's blessed name. Amen. Well, we're <clears throat> turning in God's Word this evening uh, to two portions. Seems to be our uh, habit these days, but we're looking still at Luke chapter 1 and the, the song of Zacharias, the Benedictus. And uh, we, well, it wouldn't be a bad thing if we read it so often that we actually uh, knew it by heart, but uh, we'll read a bit of it again this evening. But we'll also read from Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, that, that has relevance to what we're looking at this evening as we move on <clears throat> in this uh, study of the Benedictus and uh, noticing really how that what Zacharias uh, was singing about was, was not, you know, he wasn't uh, sort of the first century equivalent of, I'll not name any names, but some sort of singer-songwriter who decided that he was going to uh, launch his career, his sort of worship career, and you know, he'd bring out a CD and his uh, franchise, his music around the churches and stuff like that. Uh, this wasn't about being cutting edge and hip. Um, he didn't grow a fashionable beard and they would have ripped jeans and whatever else that people do these days to, to look fashionable and, and hip and trendy. Um, that's, that's the sad reality of where we are uh, today in, in many churches and in sort of the, the church scene. Uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and, and, uh, and elsewhere. What Zacharias is singing about, and what he chooses as his, his language, really, is uh, a paraphrasing of psalms and prophecies and, and other uh, themes that we find uh, heavily used in the Old Testament. And we find them employed elsewhere in the New Testament. So a new song doesn't have to be wildly different in style or anything else from what's gone before. And if it's a gospel song, it's going to sound very like other songs because you can't really deviate from that theme and it still be a gospel song. And so we've seen some of the, the, the things that are evident in this song, some of the, the terminology and where it's used elsewhere. And we've seen that really behind it all is this kind of Exodus theme and I think we'll see a little bit more of that, I'll not focus on that or, or hint at that tonight so much, but we'll focus on, on part of what he has to, to say in this song. So we'll read, first of all, from Hebrews 2, and of course, setting out the superior nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he is greater in this particular section of Hebrews, he's greater than the angels. Uh, but we'll pick up the reading at verse 9. And we'll read down to the end of the chapter. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, 
he is able to succor them that are tempted. And then uh, turning to Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke chapter 1, and we'll read just a couple of verses here from Zacharias's song. Uh, uh, we'll read from verse, well, we'll read from verse 68, uh, the beginning of the song. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Amen. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his truth. So it's the phrase at the end of verse 74 that we want to focus in upon and expand upon this evening, where Zacharias comments here that the effect of Christ's work is that he would set us free, we know, to serve the Lord. And the nature of that service is spoken of in uh, four, or sorry, three, no, we'll go back to four, four ways. Um, it's without fear. It's in righteousness and holiness. It's before God. And it is all of our days. So that's how we are to serve God. Uh, so it's not just serving God and it's sort of over to you. You decide how you would like to serve God. Uh, serving God isn't up to us. It's not a case of sort of explore your gifts and your talents and you, you can bring those, uh, if you like, to the worship service. Um, and of course, this isn't just about serving God in terms of public worship either. It's our whole life. Uh, but it's not just about what do I feel, what do I think, uh, there are certain guidelines given to us here so that whilst we serve God in our various callings in life, and we do serve God doing whatever it is that we do, there are guidelines about how we carry out those callings so that our service in that sphere, okay, so whether that's your calling in terms of work or non-work now, either re retirement or unemployment, whatever it may be, that's your calling in singleness or marriage, that's your calling as parents or, or not as parents, that's your calling as a neighbour and so on and so forth, and all the different callings that we have in our lives, how are we to discharge those responsibilities? And this is how we are to do it. First of all, it's without fear. Secondly, it's in righteousness and holiness. Thirdly, it's before the face of God. And fourthly, it's all the time, all the days of our lives. So we're looking firstly then tonight, and, and we'll not get beyond this this evening, at the thought of serving him without fear, without fear. Now we all know, because we speak English uh, with some degree of competence, um, the word for fear in Greek, because if you are uh, feared, feared, I think that's an Irish expression, isn't it? If you're feared, is it? Let's check. I, I say these things and, and I always wonder, is that, does anybody understand me? But we always talk about being feared of something. So you've got a fear of something. Well, if you are uh, sort of overcome with fear of small spaces or large spaces or spiders, you've got a Phobia. There we go. You see, we do know some Greek after all. I'm always pleased that somebody else knows as little Greek as I do. Um, you've got a phobia, phobos, the Greek word for fear. And the, and the word is translated here, you stick an A in front of a Greek word and all of a sudden you've made it negative. So, A, phobos, that means you uh, have no fear. You've got no fear without fear. And that word, A, phobos or a phobio, is used only 
three other times in the New Testament. So you don't have to go too far to find it and to see if you can build up some kind of a picture by looking at it. So that's what we'll do. First Corinthians chapter 16 is the, the next place where we come to this particular Greek word, a phobos, and it concerns Timothy. And it concerns Timothy uh, being sent by the Apostle Paul to the city of Corinth and to the church. So it's verse 10. And he says, Now if Timotheus, if Timothy come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Now, it's not our purpose tonight to delve into it. Uh, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Why might he be afraid? Uh, now, people serving the Lord sometimes are afraid. Uh, the, the Lord appeared to Paul himself when he was in Corinth, and he told him not to be afraid, for he had much people in this city. Paul was, therefore we can deduce, experiencing or moving certainly in the direction of being afraid in the Lord's work for whatever reason. The godlessness of the city, the hardness of the task, something that he had seen, something about the situation perhaps was causing him to be afraid. Maybe it was the nature of the people. Maybe it was the nature of the church. Now that Timothy's going to, we know from reading this first letter what the state of the Corinthian church was. That in itself might have made him somewhat uneasy. It's a hard place to go to with everything that's going on. Their, their slackness, their lax attitude towards morals, etc. It's going to be difficult. But you see the connection, and it's a connection that we can link with Luke 1, verse 74, because the connection is what? It's about serving God in the absence of fear. That's what Paul is saying. See that he may be with you without fear. So whatever the Corinthians are supposed to do, whether Paul is talking about their conduct, whether he's talking about them encouraging him, laboring with him, serving him, helping him, uh, doing what they can do, to, to see to it that he isn't fearful. And so there's something that you and I can do to help other people serve the Lord. Right? We can help people serve God in a way that they're not afraid. Uh, we can stand with them. Or we can support them. We can speak encouraging words. We can try and keep them doing what is right. We can strengthen one another's hand in the Lord. And we need to do that. Uh, and perhaps that's what Paul's exhorting them to do. But they're to be conscious of this man and say, look, uh, he can be afraid. And you, you can read Paul's letters to Timothy, especially 2 Timothy, and you understand that Timothy experienced some of that in other places as well. And this is to do the work of God because fear does not help us do the work of God. Right? So nobody is uh, some sort of superhuman and uh, you, know, you can read biographies of missionaries and others, and they read as if these people sometimes didn't really know what fear looked like, and they never felt it. Well, it's not, it's not an uncommon thing. Okay? God uh, has to tell all of his people at some time or other, don't be afraid, just believe. And that's comforting. It's wonderful to hear those words been spoken to, to us. So we don't need to be afraid. In other words, encourage him, help him so that he's fearless. Fearless service. Fearless service. The next time that we come across the word is Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, 14. And Paul uh, is bound in Rome. He's writing to the Philippians and he tells them, uh, about his situation and that, well, he wants them to understand something. He says in verse 12 uh, that the things which happened unto me, he said, have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So here he is, he's, he's bound, he's imprisoned, he's restricted in Rome. And those saints in Philippi that think so much of Paul are basically saying what we might say. Oh, it's not terrible. Shocking. You know, if only he were released, if only his situation were different, if only he could have liberty to travel again, think of how much good he could do. 
Um, he's there. He's, he's restricted. There's that word again. But Paul says, I want you to understand something. I don't want you to be fretting. I don't want you to be having all of these thoughts about how things could be and how they should be and all the rest of it. He said, be encouraged because my being imprisoned here, my being held uh, under a certain degree of limitation in, in my freedom, that's, that's fallen out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ or for Christ are manifest in all the palace or Caesar's court and in all other places. So even in Caesar's court, in Caesar's household, the gospel is being made known. In the very highest echelons of power in the Roman Empire are now touched with the gospel. And he says in verse 14, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing, growing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word a phobos, fearlessly, boldly, without fear. And he says that's a good thing. That encourages Paul. He can't preach freely, but he's looking on, he's hearing the reports, and he sees other people are being emboldened by seeing what's happening with him, seeing how he's taking the gospel into the palace and so on. And this is encouraging them. And so they're, they're, they're growing more and more confident. Right? It's not, um, just a little note here. Sometimes we feel as if it's either, you're, you're either sort of 0% or 100%. You're either really timid and fearful and you can't do anything and you're not going to do anything. Or you're, you're 100% charged and you're just ready to go. And you're bold and you're assertive and you're fearless and you're, and we think well, there's, there's not really anything in between. Well, Paul shows us that there's actually a sliding scale here. There are people who are waxing confident. They're, they're getting more confident. They're not 100% confident. And they're not as confident as they perhaps could be, but they're not as fearful or unconfident as they were before. They're getting more confident in witnessing to Christ. That's encouraging, isn't it? Because that means that you and I can become more bold than we are tonight. That's reassuring. I find that reassuring for myself as well as for my brethren and sisters, that, that we can grow more confident and that we can speak the word without fear. Without fear. And that's, again, we can see this is what, this is what Zacharias is singing about, isn't it? That the Lord Jesus Christ had come to set people free from their enemies so that they would serve the Lord without fear. That they could do it without hindrance, without restriction. Now the, the next, uh, the third and final uh, use is in Jude. So this is the, it's the fourth in the New Testament, but it's the third outside of Luke. And it's in Jude. Uh, Jude, in verse 12. This is a negative example uh, of it. Uh, so in one sense it doesn't apply, but if you, if you take it and turn it on its head, you can see the point still uh, manifested. These are spots in your feasts of charity. These are the people, I should we go back to verse 11, they're like Cain and Balaam. They're, they do things for reward. Right there. They're not doing it because it's the right thing to do. They're doing it because there's, there's something they think they can get out of it. They, they, they see a financial, they see a promotional benefit to them socially, materially, or some other way. There's, there's a benefit, and that's why they're doing it. And he says, These are spots in your feasts of charity and your love feast, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. There's something that they shouldn't be doing. There's something that they should be fearful to do, but they go ahead and do it without fear when they should actually do it with fear. Okay, so it, it has that, the, the sort of flip side of this. There are people who should be full of fear about doing certain things, in particular about the love feast, and we can apply that to the Lord's table, but they don't, uh, and it should stop them. And so we, we look at that and say, well, there, there are people who, who should be so afraid of, of treading uh, in a holy place uh, that they, dare, they should not dare to go there, but flip that around and, and see what that 
illustrates for us, if we're saved tonight, about what we are to do. There's nowhere where we should be afraid to go. There's no situation where we should be afraid because we've been saved to serve God without fear. We should not be afraid to serve him. And, and this is really what the apostles prayed for in the church, the early church. And you remember how uh, in Acts, the early chapters of Acts, Acts chapter 5, that after they'd been threatened and intimidated, they were released. They, they sought out the rest of the church, sorry, at the end of chapter 4, and they prayed again. And they prayed for what? They prayed once again for boldness, that they might proclaim the word of God. And, and the Lord filled them again with his spirit. Now, if you turn over to the Old Testament, and uh, what we're doing is looking at uh, the, this Greek word as it's used elsewhere. So we're, we're thinking about the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. And there's a little verse at the end of Proverbs 1 that uses this Greek word. And uh, it just helps us to see how this is used in the Old Testament a little bit as well. Not spend much time in this, but just to, to note it. Uh, Proverbs 1 is talking about wisdom. Wisdom is speaking as she, as she does. She's personified. She's given a, a sort of the idea of personhood. And so rather than just being an abstract sort of concept of wisdom, She's presented, her wisdom is presented as this, this lady. And she speaks. And she encourages people to listen to her and to attend to her. And she tells us uh, why that's beneficial. And in fact, if you read, and I would encourage you, read Proverbs 1 again. Because it has a lot to say and it speaks to our current situation when there's so much fear. Because wisdom tells us uh, without fear, of being contradicted without any reservation, wisdom says, I can deal with fear. And in fact, if you listen to me and you pay attention to me, you'll not have fear. Now, what is wisdom? Ah, well, wisdom in a proverbial sense is to know God, is to have God, to have his mind which in scriptural terms is to have the word of God. That's where wisdom comes from. You can't be wise, you can't have wisdom without hearing God. It's the gospel. So the word of God, the gospel, God through his son says to us, if you possess this gospel wisdom, this spiritual insight, you've got the inoculation against fear. Not just the antidote, you don't even have to have fear and have it dealt with. This is a preventative. This saves you from fear. And so it's, it's well worth listening to. And at the end then of this chapter, we read these words. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Now, if you take the, the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament and you translate that last sentence or that last phrase rather a little bit more literally what you would have is that you will be still without fear from all evil. You'll be still. You'll be at rest without fear from all evil. That's a beautiful thought. If we embrace God's truth, the effect of that in our lives, in our being, in our heart, in our mind, is to be still, to be perfectly quiet. No agitation, not being pulled all over the place, not distressed, not thrown about by whatever it is that throws you about. You'll not be thrown about and all over the place, you'll be at rest. You'll not be fearful. You'll be fearless. And that's not a, it's not a wrong thing to be. It's not wrong to be fearless. You're not being too bold. You're, you're not setting yourself up. Uh, we're exhorted to be fearless in this sense by God. And he says, he he's the one that tells us that this 
is what is possible and fearless from all evil. And in fact, the, the, the thought there, if you turn over to the book of Jeremiah, um, he says something um, a couple of times. Uh, we find it in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 30 and the verse 10. First of all, and it's repeated in chapter 46 as well. Um, this, this idea of uh, rest, <clears throat> Jeremiah 30, verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. What was Zechariah singing about? Being freed from the hand of our enemies? Freed from those that hate us? What's Jeremiah talking about? About Israel being free from their enemies? And in what state will they be? Well, they'll be in this state or condition. They will be in rest. They will be quiet. And none shall make him afraid. They'll be fearless. That's what Zechariah is talking about. What's Jeremiah talking about? He's talking about the same thing that Zechariah is talking about. What's that? It's the effect of Christ's salvation. This is the gospel. And you'll see the same words in Zechariah. So not Zechariah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 46. Jeremiah 46, the verse 27. So the language really is repeated. Uh, but fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and be it in rest, and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. This is what the Lord has been promising. And uh, in fact, if you, the, word, the, the Hebrew word there is uh, Shean. Um, and there's a place called Beth Shean, the house of... Uh, really uh, rest of the house of quiet, the house of no fear. And uh, it, it's interesting that uh, that was the, the place where uh, Saul and Jonathan were taken and from where those brave men of Israel went and, and took their, their bodies and uh, brought them away from the Philistines. Um, and in some ways, that, that, that it shows us the contrast. The world is not afraid to lift up its hand against the Lord. There's a lack of fear there when there should be fear, like Jude, verse 12. But the, the people of God who will do what is right, they can be fearless. And they've got a, a greater fearlessness than the world. The world should fear, but they don't. We should not fear. Sometimes we do. But let us realize that we do not need to be afraid. And so we're saved from fear. Well, Fear, as we understand it, renders us limited, doesn't it? Uh, again, uh, the book of Proverbs, uh, I think we know the verse fairly well, that the fear of man brings a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. He'll be safe. But if, if we fear men, we're going to be limited. We're going to be ensnared. And the word... Uh, snare there in Proverbs 29, 25. Uh, it, can, it can either picture a noose that goes around your neck, obviously, or it's like a hook that would be put into perhaps your nose or your mouth. Uh, and it, it means that people are being led. The fear of man causes us to be led in a particular direction. Not just that we are incapacitated to do nothing, but we're, we're being led in a different direction. We're doing something else other than walking in the Lord's ways. And when we fear Man, instead of following the Lord, instead of walking in his ways, instead of walking in the footsteps of the Savior and walking in the narrow way, we end up walking in a different way. Because we fear men, we fear what they will say, we fear what they will think, or what they will think of us. And you've got a, a good example of that with the, uh, the, the Pharisees and so forth. Remember, they were asking Jesus by what authority he taught and did what he did in the temple. And he cleansed the temple. And he gave that great response. Where he says, well, you answer me my question and I'll answer yours. Right? 
the baptism of John. Was that from God or was it of man? Really throws the Pharisees in there, right? Pickle. What do you, how do you answer that question? Hmm. And they, they, they give it the old political thought, don't they? Well, if we say it was from heaven, we're in a bit of a jam there because we didn't go along with it. And that would be to condemn ourselves. We, yeah, we have to, can't answer that. It's not answer A. So it must be answer B. It was of man. Ah, the people, the general people thought it was not of man, but they thought it was of God. If we say it was of men, there's going to be rebellion. There's going to be insurrection. People are going to hate us. We're going to lose any popular support. We can't answer B either. And there is no option C. So they I don't know. Can't tell you. But why did they not answer option B? It was of men or of man. Because they feared the people. The fear of man brings a snare. You're afraid of what people will think and therefore you won't answer. You won't do anything. You won't try and do what is right because you're more interested in currying popular opinion. You're more interested in people's opinion of you and them thinking that you're a good sort and all the rest of it. And you're more concerned with your public image than you are with doing what is right. And it's never uh, a good thing when any individual Christian or the Christian church generally has more of an eye to its public image and the perception of the world than it does to the well done of God. Because let's be honest tonight, it really doesn't matter what the church does. People won't think well of it. History plainly demonstrates that hospitals, education, much of the good laws in our land are all rooted in a Christian heritage. What do people today tell you about Christianity? Terrible thing because it's responsible for so many wars and so many deaths. They, can't, they, they sort of forget about that little bit about health care and, and uh, sort of prison reform and abolition of slavery and education and sort of general wel welfare and even looking after animals. And that, that kind of gets lost somewhere. You know, but it's all the wars, that's all to do with Christianity. See, it doesn't really matter what you do. You can, you can have the best PR company. What was it? Um, Sat no, was it Satchi and Satchi? That was it, wasn't it? You can get them to work for you, the church, and put on a great campaign. People still aren't going to think the church is anything. Never will. But you see, that's, that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to try and attract people's popular acclaim. And if we are worried about what people think of us and we're afraid of their faces, what are we going to do? We're not going to do anything. We'll not serve the Lord because we'll be constantly looking over our shoulder to see what the world thinks of us. Jesus Christ hasn't set you free for you to be looking at the world wondering, what are they thinking of me? What are they saying about me? You know, sometimes it hurts. I reckon that when... Agrippa said to Paul, Paul, uh, Paul, you've been spending too long in the books, my friend. You've gone loco. You're crazy. You're mad. That could have stung, couldn't it? Because, you know, Paul was an intellectual type. Um, that, that may well have irked him if he'd been worried about what people thought of him. But he wasn't worried about that. He was more worried about what the Lord thought of him and about the souls of the people that were listening to him. And so he, he says to Agrippa, I'm not mad, oh Agrippa. I just believe the prophets. I believe the word of God. You might think this sounds a bit crazy, but I just believe the truth. And I wish that you were exactly like me, except for these bonds. I wish you knew the truth as well. And that's where we need to be. We're not apologizing for what we believe. We're not afraid of what people think of what we believe. But we actually, when they say we're crazy, we say, you know what? I'm not actually crazy. I just believe the truth. And I wish you would believe the truth too. It would be good for you if you did. And Christ has set us free. That's why we read Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 reminds us that we've been set free from fear. Okay, because Paul says here that people have been uh, in bondage. That's what he says, isn't it, in verse 15. 
and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What does that make you think of? There were certain people, weren't they, delivered out of the house of bondage. This is our exodus pattern once again. This is what Jesus Christ has done. And if people are in bondage, they are enslaved to something. They are bound. They're not free. They're not free to serve. They're captivated by something or in, uh, they're captured by something. And here, uh, verse 14 reminds us that it was the devil. He that had the power of death. That is the devil. That's not to say that the devil uh, is one who determines when people die or whatever else. But that is pointing at the fact that the devil was the one who came and tempted Eve and Adam to sin and continues to tempt people to sin. That cause of death. And he says that, that Satan is there and, and he, he has a hold over people. We know Paul says that in Ephesians 2 as well. That we are led by the, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience. But we've been set free from that. Once we were, once we were the willing dupes of Satan, but we've been set free. Yes, our members, we know from Romans 7 again, there's still that law that is at work in our members. We, we still feel some urge to sin. There's still uh, something in us, uh, some remnants of an appetite that, that still thinks about and enjoys sinning and, and would, would feel an impulse to sin. It didn't, didn't originate in our thoughts necessarily. We didn't sit down and think about it and plan it all out. It just seems to come from nowhere and we're, we're tempted to sin. And, and it, there's a, a, a thought that arises within us then that that would actually be a, a good thing and, and desirable and so on. But we've been set free from total enslavement to that. We've been set free to actually serve God with our mind and with our heart to know what is right and to, to see the goodness in God's way and to follow God in his good way, to see that the law, the word of God is good and it is holy. And it's the Holy Spirit that moves us to serve. I, I mentioned Timothy being fearful and we know well, I'm sure, that verse in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has not given us the spirit of fear. But he's given us the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind, or that could be translated self-control. You've been given this spirit. Now, the thing is, we are to acknowledge that tonight. We have to receive this by faith. Don't, don't interpret that verse by your experience. Your experience does not determine whether that verse is right or not. The verse is right. And the truth that's contained in that portion of Scripture needs to affect my experience and not the other way around. My experience doesn't cast a shadow over the text. The truth there must alter my experience. Because Timothy experienced fear. Paul's saying to him, you've been given a different spirit. He's not beating him with a big stick and saying, what a miserable failure you are. He's saying, look, remember, Timothy, remember what God has given you. The temptation is now to, to look at those things that are causing you to be fearful, to look at the fear, to see your own timidity and your weakness and to see nothing else and, and to cower away and do nothing. But remember, God has given you his spirit. This is true. This isn't just positive rhetoric, the power of positive thinking. It's not think about it enough and it'll It'll materialize into your reality. Nothing like that. This is rather an objective reality. God has given you something. Acknowledge that. Receive it by faith. And it's the spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So how do we serve without fear? How do we serve without fear? Because it's all right talking about it, but... How does this work out practically, very quickly? So we've been given the spirit that is the opposite to the spirit of fear. And, and you go over to Romans 8, 15. Uh, we've been given the spirit of what? Adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And again, it's, it's the spirit uh, uh, there that Paul talks about that means that we don't have to fear. So the spirit is connected with not fearing. Who is the spirit and what does he do? Well, he's the spirit of what? He's the spirit of truth. How do you overcome fear with truth? Why does fear exist? Well, where, did, where does fear come from? Why were people afraid? They were afraid 
of the devil. The one really who through his work kept people in, in bondage. Shut up. How does he do that? He lies to them. He tells lies. And whenever there are lies, there will always be fear. That's how people are often manipulated and controlled. Somebody tells a lie. Causes people to fear. And when that happens, you can manipulate people. One of the great rules... Not great rules. I came out wrong. I misspoke. One of the terrible rules of propaganda is basically you lie, but you lie often enough that people will believe it. And... Once you tell enough lies and people start to believe it, you can manipulate them. And, and generally that is by fear. And you look through history, that's how it works. That's what the devil does. People live in fear. And the only way, the only antidote to fear is truth. Think about your fears. How many of your fears are based on a lie? Now, not, not necessarily a lie where it's all very deviously made up and put out there to you. But a lie in this sense. How often have you been afraid of something that you have imagined? Something that's in your mind. The fear of what might be. The fear of how things are going to work out. The fear that you feel stems out of this root of your imagination. Your thoughts. And oftentimes those thoughts are, yes, they're from your own heart, your own mind. But it can also be the suggestions of the, the enemy of your soul who gets you to think in such a way that is at odds with what God says in his word. He's lying to you to keep you afraid. Because if you're fearful, what, what, what are you doing? You can't serve God in the way that you're supposed to. So it's important from the devil's perspective to get you to think about and believe something that's not true. The antidote to fear is truth. When I was young, um, I don't know what age, I, I hope I was younger than 10. I, I know I was, I'm, I'm, I'm jesting, I, I was quite young at the time. And you'll understand when I, why when I tell you the story that I, I hope I was younger than 16 and 10. Uh, it was on the news, so remember I'm living in Ireland, uh, right up on the north coast. And it was on the news one night that a tiger had escaped from some safari park or zoo somewhere in I don't know, England, down in the southeast somewhere. Well, for several nights thereafter, I was terrified of walking past the front door of the house. Because in my childish mind, you see, I was, hopefully I was younger than 16. In my childish mind, I had this idea that as I walked up the hall, and I was about to turn up the stairs at the, at the front door, that bang, this thing was going to burst through the door and gobble me up. So I would gingerly get up the hall, get to that spot, and then run around the corner and get up the stairs as quickly as I could, just in case it got me. And I was afraid. I didn't tell anybody. I certainly didn't tell my elder brothers, because they would have had a field day with that one. It was irrational, wasn't it? And all somebody needed to do to really help me was to point out a few basic truths. That tigers aren't the best swimmers. You ain't going to swim the Irish Sea. Nobody's going to let it on to the ferry at least not willingly, um, you know, chances of that thing appearing at my front door are really slim, really slim. Truth would have helped a lot. Now, of course, I was stupid enough not to, not to air my fears. If you don't air your fears to the Lord or other people, guess what? Not going to go away. Right? You have to air them. You have to tell somebody about them. You have to go seeking the truth that will set you free. And, and you've got cases that very, very quickly we'll, we'll finger through a few scriptures here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Joseph's afraid. He doesn't know what to do. He's in a situation. He's espoused to be married to Mary. She's pregnant. What do you do? He's a just man. He's a decent sort. He, he's, he's noble. He doesn't want to hurt her. He doesn't want to cause her any shame. He wants to do things as well as he can for everybody involved. And, and he's afraid to take her to be his wife. And there's a visitation from the angel and the angel says to Joseph, Joseph, thy son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. He's afraid. What changes his fear? What takes away his fear? There's a message from God that brings 
truth into his situation. And the truth of God, the truth of Christ, the truth of the work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, does what? Dispels his fears. And he can serve God in the way that he's called to serve God, which is to marry Mary, which is to provide a stable home for the young child, Jesus. That's Joseph's calling. Don't read much of him, but that's what he did. That was his ministry, wasn't it? How did he serve God? He fled with his wife and his stepchild into Egypt, preserving him, keeping him safe, providing a home, providing for his wife and his stepson and his subsequent children. But his fears were, were relieved by the speaking of truth. And, and that continues, in, in, especially in Luke's gospel, with angelic visitation, uh, Zacharias himself, uh, he's fearful when he sees the angel, and you've got lots of cases like that. Uh, and Luke records him, uh, incidentally, where Zacharias is afraid because he sees the angel. Mary's afraid, and uh, also in chapter 1 of Luke, because when she sees the angel, uh, you've got, in, in chapter 2, the shepherds are afraid when they see the angels. Uh, in chapter 5, uh, the Lord Jesus appears again to Peter with the miraculous catch of fish. Peter, remember, he sees manifestation of the Godhead of deity, of, of divine power, and it causes him terror because people are afraid when they see God manifest it. And in each one of these cases, the people are told to fear not. The angel tells Zacharias, don't be afraid. The angel tells Mary, don't be afraid. The angels tell the shepherds, don't be afraid. Jesus tells Peter, don't be afraid. Why? Because here's what God is doing. Here's revelation. Here's the truth. Your fears are based on this idea that you have uh, that what you're seeing or, or what you're witnessing or what you're involved in at the present time is somehow going to lead your, to your destruction. But God has a message in this for you. Here's what's really happening. It's not what you imagine. Here's what's really taking place. And that truth causes the fears to vanish. And on the basis of that truth, they can start living and serving God. And that absence of fear, the absence of fear that we have as Christians, the absence of fear that, that Jesus Christ brings is, is the knowledge of salvation, that we're not under condemnation. And that sets us free to serve the Lord. And, and it's that that we need to focus on because it's, it's that that puts everything else into perspective. And we, we know well, Matthew 10, for example, when Jesus is sending out the disciples, he addresses some of the things that they're going to be afraid about. What are people going to do to us? What are people going to say about us? And how are we going to be provided for? And the Lord Jesus speaks of fear not to every one of those things. What are people going to say about you? They're going to call you rotten. They're going to misrepresent you and so on. Well, nothing that is done in secret is going to stay hidden. It's going to be revealed at the last. They'll pay for that in the end. You'll be vindicated in the end. Might they kill you? They might. But that's not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that could happen is if you were to be destroyed physically and spiritually, if your body and your soul were to be destroyed. So fear God instead of fearing men. Don't be afraid that they can kill you. Fear God, rather, and live in the fear of God. And don't worry about being provided for because there isn't a sparrow that falls to the ground, but the Lord knows all about it, and you're worth more than many sparrows, so don't be afraid. The Lord speaks into our situation to tell us, look, put everything into perspective. It's not about what can happen to you here physically. It's, it's about the spiritual reality. And that's why Paul, at the end of the fourth chapter in 2 Corinthians, into chapter 5, and you read that passage, the last, I think, three verses in chapter 4 and, and through into chapter 5, that's where we have him talking about, you know, if, the, if the outward man perishes, well, that's not the big issue. If the inner man is being strengthened, that's the thing. So, in a sense, he's saying, and he's not being glib about it, and he's not being blasé, but he's basically saying, look, so what that the outward man perishes? So long as the inner man is being strengthened. As long as I'm getting spiritually stronger, that's all that really matters. And he says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And he goes on to talk about how this tabernacle is going to have to be put off. We're going to put on something far more glorious, and that's what we're to live for. 
And that's the perspective. It's like the psalmist, remember Psalm 73? He's distraught when he sees other people prospering. They don't seem to have the problems that he has. And, and life seems to be easy and all the rest of it. When you look at the big wigs in the world that are doing this, that and the other. And you know, everybody else is struggling at the present time. And the Jeff Bezoses and Elon Musks and whoever else in the world. It's been a good time the past year for billionaires. They've, they've got richer. And it's been good for them. And people can look at that and say it's not fair. And it's not. But the wrong thing would be to do would be to look at people like that and others and start to think, you know what, I'm wasting my time here. And the psalmist felt that way until he went into the sanctuary. And he got a bit of eternal perspective on life. And when he saw beyond this life, beyond life under the sun, and he saw into eternity, and he saw where those people were headed in eternity, he suddenly realized there's nothing there to be jealous of. There's nothing there to envy. Because they're going to be ruined. They're going to be destroyed in hell in a moment of time. I've got something better to aim for. Therefore, I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be envious. I don't need to be jealous. I can be, I can be bold. And I can serve the Lord freely. You've been saved to serve. And you've been saved to serve how? Without fear. Why? Because it doesn't matter what people do to you. It doesn't matter what actually happens in the course of that service. Because whatever people do to you, the one thing they can't do is separate you from the love of God. Because you've been given the spirit, the spirit of adoption, the spirit that doesn't produce fear. The spirit that guarantees that God has a future plan.